in this video you are about to watch, I am clearly stating my opinion and nothing more. I am not promoting hate speech, I am not harassing anyone, and I am not bullying anyone. I am clearly only stating my opinion. And under the Constitution, we have the right to free speech. And that is clearly all I am doing. Nothing more than stating my opinion. I will be using some clips in my video and they qualify for the Fair Use Act. And with my opinion, not promoting hate speech, harassment, or bullying in this video, I will be obtaining a lawyer if YouTube tells me to take my video down. Thank you. If you watched my video called Posting on Social Ma Media, you may be put in a mental institution or in jail. Well, folks, it's true. President Trump will be meeting with people to uh, put this Baxter Act into effect. As you heard on that video, that the so-called Sheriff Israel was calling out for um, officers to be able to come in your home and take you if they find Anything you post on social media as a threat. So anything you post could be a threat. So if I was you, I'd be watching what I post. But, you know, he also put a ban on bump stocks as of today to make any gun in the United States for civilian use, may I say, any gun in the United States that is turned into a machine gun by civilians is banned. Banned, mind you. I told you guys all this was going to happen. And I told you it was my opinion that all the stuff in you know where happen because of they want to take our guns and they also wanted this law implemented to where they can come in your home and take you out of your home if they find anything that you post a threat. Let's listen to Trump's speech now. This week I be holding a number of discussions with students, local leaders, and law enforcement to develop concrete steps that we can take to secure our schools, safeguard our students, and protect our communities. School safety is a top priority for my administration. That is why, when governors from across the nation visit the White House next week, we will be discussing at great length what the federal and state governments can do to keep our students safe. This includes implementing common sense security measures and addressing mental health issues, including better coordination between federal and state law enforcement to take swift action when there are warning signs. In a yep, and there goes, they are going, what? to go on with the Baxter Act, where anything you post on social media that they find that is a threat, they can take you out of your home and take you into custody and lock you in a facility. That's exactly what this is. That is exactly what he is talking about. Because, as you've seen, the sheriff got up there and said that they needed where police officers can go in and just remove somebody out of their home 
if they find it threatening. So anything you post that they find threatening to their agenda, they are going to come and take you out of your home and lock you up. After the deadly shooting in Las Vegas, I directed Attorney General to clarify whether certain bump stock devices, like the one used in Las Vegas, are illegal under current law. That process began in December, and just a few moments ago, I signed a memorandum directing the Attorney General to propose regulations to ban all devices that turn legal weapons into machine guns. Oh, I know, but I'm sure when they run up in our house to take us out of our homes, the people that run up in our homes will have machine guns. But us civilians, we're not allowed to have machine guns. Why? Because in my opinion, the fake charade that went on with the shooting. I expect that these critical regulations will be finalized, Jeff, very soon. The key in all of these efforts, as I said in my remarks the day after the shooting, is that we cannot merely take actions that make us feel like we are making a difference. We must actually make a difference. This morning uh, uh, tweeted about oh, the warning signs, uh, and, and there were some people who interpreted that he was sort of um, saying that people should have done more. Obviously, the, there were certain things known about this individual. He was expelled from the school for this very reason. What is your feeling about, about that? My feelings are the, the different states uh, talk about being able to involuntarily take a suspect or a subject who might be the, uh, the victim of mental health illness and bringing them to a facility where they could be evaluated and treated. In Florida, we call it a Baker Act. Um, the only time a police officer can Baker Act a subject is when they're an immediate, an immediate threat to themselves or someone else. Um, I'm going to ask every legislator, every lawmaker that will listen that this Baker Act statute needs to be changed and police officers, deputy sheriffs who have information that a subject has posted some horrific pictures or videos on his or her website. Uh, they use bloody uh, bombs, guns, rifles, things like that. Police have to have the ability to take these people involuntarily if necessary to be examined yeah they have to have the ability to take you when no crime has been committed against your will just if you post a picture of something just if you post a picture of something anything they can take you and put you in a psychiatric ward. Isn't that something? He is calling for people to be admitted to the psychiatric hospitals and the police to have the ability to put you in a psychiatric ward if you post something that they do not like and you think that's not going to happen, why do you think the FEMA camps are around? This will be enacted and they will start throwing people in psychiatric wards, especially truthers. They will be the first to be thrown in these FEMA camps, psychiatric hospitals, whatever you want to call them. Why? Because they don't like what we are posting. So anything you post will be held against you. Now they want to be able to throw you in a psychiatric ward or jail when no crime has been committed. Isn't that something? Yeah. By mental health professionals. Terrorism. 
President Obama today proposed something new, something called prolonged detention. Doesn't sound that bad, right? Prolonged. Did you ever see the movie Minority Report? It was based on a Philip K. Dick short story. It came out in 2002. It starred Tom Cruise, remember? He played a police officer in something called the Department of Pre-Crime. Pre-crime is where people are arrested and incarcerated to prevent crimes that they have not yet committed. Mr. Marks. My mandate of the District of Columbia Pre-Crime Division. I'm placing you under arrest for the future murder of Sarah Marks and Donald Dubin. That was take place today, April 22nd. It's 0800 hours and four minutes. No, I didn't do anything. You didn't do anything, but you're gonna. Future murder. Creepy, right? Putting somebody in jail, not for what they've done, but for what you're very sure they're going to do? There may be a number of people who cannot be prosecuted for past crimes. In some cases, because evidence may be tainted. But who nonetheless pose a threat to the security of the United States. We're not prosecuting them for past crimes, but we need to keep them in prison because of our expectation of their future crimes. Al-Qaeda terrorists and their affiliates are at war with the United States, and those that we capture, like other prisoners of war, must be prevented from attacking us again. Prevented. We will incarcerate people preventively. Preventive incarceration. Indefinite detention without trial. That's what, that's what this is. That's what President Obama proposed today, if you strip away the euphemisms. One civil liberties advocate told the New York Times today, quote, we've known this was on the horizon for many years, but we were able to hold it off with George Bush. The idea that we might find ourselves fighting with the Obama administration over these powers is really stunning. And it is stunning, particularly to hear President Obama claim the power to keep people in prison indefinitely with no charges against them, no conviction, no sentence, just imprisonment. It's particularly stunning to hear him make that claim in the middle of a speech that was all about the rule of law. But we must do so with an abiding confidence in the rule of law. Our government was defending positions that undermine the rule of law to ensure that they are in line with the rule of law. How can a president speak the kind of poetry that President Obama does about the rule of law and call for the power to indefinitely, preventively imprison people because they might commit crimes in the future? How can those two things coexist in the same man, even in the same speech? Well, that brings us to the self-consciously awkward, embarrassing part of this speech today. After condemning the Bush administration for what he called their ad hoc legal strategy for trying to make things seem legal that patently weren't, this is what President Obama proposed. My administration has begun to reshape the standards that apply to ensure that they are in line with the rule of law. We must have clear, defensible, and lawful standards for those who fall into this category. We must have a thorough process of periodic review so that any prolonged detention is carefully evaluated and justified. Our goal is to construct a legitimate legal framework for the remaining Guantanamo detainees that cannot be transferred. Our goal is not to avoid a legitimate legal framework. In our constitutional system, prolonged detention should not be the decision of any one man. If and when we determine that the United States must hold individuals to keep them from carrying out an act of war, we will do so within a system that involves judicial and congressional oversight. And so going forward, my administration will work with Congress to develop an appropriate legal regime so that our efforts are consistent with our values and our Constitution. You'll construct a legal regime to make indefinite detention legal. You will, what does he say? Develop an appropriate legal regime so you can construct a whole new system outside the courts, even outside the military commissions, so that you can indefinitely imprison people without charges, and you'll build that system from scratch. What's that somebody said about ad hoc legal strategies? 
Just for context here, in the United Kingdom, where there isn't even a Bill of Rights, there's been a major debate about whether people can be held in preventive detention. Former British Prime Minister Tony Blair wanted three months to be the outer limit for how long anyone could be held. There was a big political fight about it. Parliament ended up limiting that power to 28 days. 28 days is still the longest period of preventive detention that's allowed under law in any comparable democracy anywhere in the world. How long would President Obama's proposed preventive indefinite detention last? Well, he's not saying yet, but here's how he defines the threat that he says makes indefinite detention necessary. Right now in distant training camps and in crowded cities, there are people plotting to take American lives. That will be the case a year from now, five years from now, and in all probability, ten years from now. Ten years from now. So you could get arrested today and locked up without a trial, without being convicted, without being sentenced for, say, 10 years until the threat of your future criminal behavior passes. Prolonged detention, he's calling it. This was a beautiful speech from President Obama today with patriotic, moving, even poetic language about the rule of law and the Constitution and one of the most radical proposals for defying the Constitution. Does the government work for us or do we work for the government? When times are tough and the government is confronted with the profound conflict of individual freedom versus the power of the state, can it simply ignore the Constitution? Tonight, freedom, the Constitution, and you. When we were colonists of the King of England, our economy was doing quite well. Many of the most successful business entrepreneurs actually came here in order to start businesses free from the regulations and taxes that had been imposed upon them in Great Britain. Soon the King and his ministers realized how well our forefathers were doing here, so they persuaded Parliament to begin to tax the colonists and to regulate them. Many industries here were sending tax dollars there, and eventually the British ministers in England were telling businessmen in the colonies how how and with whom to do business. Everyone remembers the battle cry that the pamphleteers and editorial writers of the day used so effectively. Taxation without representation is tyranny. So we fought a revolution. We won the revolution. We wrote a constitution. And in the constitution, the framers wrote safeguards to assure that the new government here could not do to Americans what the British king and the parliament had done to the colonists. British soldiers had author were authorized to write their own search warrants, for example. So the framers prohibited that in the Fourth Amendment, which states that only judges can issue search warrants, and they may only do so when the government presents evidence to them of a crime. Well, that hasn't worked out because the Patriot Act lets federal agents write their own search warrants. The Constitution protects businesses by prohibiting states from interfering with voluntary contracts between businesses and consumers. Well, that hasn't worked out because the states today tax almost every voluntary exchange we have. In some states, almost a dollar of what you pay for a gallon of gas goes to the government. The Fifth Amendment prohibits the government from taking property without paying for it, just as the king and the parliament had done. Well, that too hasn't worked out as planned because the feds take property from us almost every day. It's called income taxes. I think you get the point of this. The whole purpose of the Constitution was to assure that the government would respect individual liberty, that power would be separated between the states and the federal government, and the government would remain within the confines of the Constitution. Throughout history, the government has openly mocked the Constitution. Lincoln claimed he could violate parts of it in order to preserve other parts. Wilson said that somehow it gave him the power to tell folks how to live. FDR actually wrote laws himself and had them enforced, even though the Constitution only permits Congress to write laws. George W. Bush signed laws into existence and in the act of signing them said he never intended to enforce them. Yesterday, President Obama signed an executive order claiming the right to incarcerate persons in the Guantanamo Bay military prison for the rest of their natural lives, even after acquittal. After acquittal, yes, you heard that correctly. Following upon what President Bush proclaimed, President Obama claimed the power to punish people even after a jury has found them not guilty. No Western government has ever claimed the power to do this. Not the King of England, not Hitler, not Stalin, not even the Russian and Chinese communists. Now, I realize that most Americans have little sympathy for those incarcerated at Gitmo. Most assume that because they're there, they must be guilty of something. But that view turns the Constitution on its head. When he was a senator and running for president, Barack Obama knew that. 
and stated that the beauty of the Constitution is that it guarantees fairness to everyone. He was right. But as president, he wants to lock people up forever, even after a jury finds them not guilty. Why should you care about this? Because if the government gets away with it by demonizing these prisoners and making it the popular thing to happen, it might happen to you. Tomorrow on Friday, Executive Order 10990 allows the government to take over all modes of transportation and control the highways and seaports. 10995 allows the government to seize and control the communications media. 10997 allows the government to take over all electrical power, gas, petroleum, fuels, and minerals. 10998 allows the government to seize all means of transportation, including personal cars, trucks, or vehicles of any kind. 10999 allows the government to take over all food resources and farms. Executive Order 11,000 allows the government to mobilize civilians into work brigades under government supervision. 11,001 allows the government to take over all health, education, and welfare functions. 11,002 designates the Postmaster General to operate a national registration of all persons. 11,003 allows the government to take over all airports and aircraft, including commercial aircraft. 11,004 allows the Housing and Finance Authority to relocate communities, build new housing with public funds, and designate areas to be abandoned. 11,005 allows the government to take over railroads, inland waterways, and public storage facilities. 11,921 gives the Federal Emergency Preparedness Agency the authority to take over all banking institutions in the United States. As we've just seen, there are laws on the books that make it perfectly legal for the United States government to suspend citizens' rights. However, if we look to the founding documents for guidance, we'll find that it's not our government that bestows these rights upon us in the first place. According to the founders, all of our rights are unalienable. So what does that mean? According to Webster's Dictionary, the definition of unalienable is not capable of being transferred to another, or in layman's terms, non-negotiable, not to be forfeited, or birthright. How much plainer can it possibly be? Our founding documents tell us that these rights cannot be transferred or taken away by anyone, not by any person, not by any government. So if the government passes laws that violate the Constitution, how can they enforce those bad laws? It's very simple. We let them do it. I told y'all this was going to happen, and I told y'all that that's why the incident happened. So they would have the ability to change the statues of the Baker Act. Now, now anything you post will be subject to screening, and if they don't like what you post, they can come in your home and take you out of your home and take you to a mental facility or jail or wherever they want to take you, and they can hold you for as long as they want. They could hold you for the rest of your life if they wanted to. That is the bills that Obama signed in. That you could be held for not committing a crime, for a so-called crime that they say you will commit in the future because of something you posted on social media, and they can hold you for the rest of your life if they feel like it. Man, brothers and sisters, I don't know what to tell you. All I can say is buckle up because we're in for a ride. Things are about to get really bumpy. And, you know, it goes for truthers too. Because truthers will be targeted for what we post and for what we put out. I just don't even know what to say to this. I just don't. And... You know, for Trump to change the statue and for him to ban these uh, bump stocks, 
you know, it's just ridiculous. And then he's wanting to cut off food stamps to people that really need them. Or may I say, not cut them off, but make them feel even lower than what they already feel. He is wanting to send them blue apron boxes where they get no fresh meat, they get no fresh vegetables, they get no fresh fruit. Everything is in cans down to their meat. They get milk that you do not refrigerate that is in a bag. Do you know how low and dirty that is? So you're telling me only people that can afford to pay with cash will get to eat real meat, will get to drink real milk, will get real fruits and vegetables because this is the program that Trump is wanting to put in. What about the people that have medical needs that cannot eat that stuff that is in all cans? What about that? What about people that is allergic to certain things that they put in these canned foods to sustain them. What about that? You know, this is the lowest thing that anybody has done. People that can't afford food is on food stamps for a reason. And for you, for Trump, may I say, to go and try to put these people on food that basically a dog won't eat is a doggone shame. I will say that that is low down and dirty, if you ask me. That is really low. I cannot believe that. These people are going to feel even worse than what they already do. Do you know how bad people feel to have to even ask for help in the first place? Then he wants to make them feel like shit even more. You know, yeah, this is my opinion, and I can express my opinion. I am not harassing, and I am not bullying anybody. I just think it is really low for him to do that. So you're telling me you would feed your child this meat that comes in a can that has probably sat in this can for years? You're telling me you would feed your child with all this canned crap because that's basically what it is. It's shelf sustainable food that will last for years. It is garbage. These people are on food stamps for a reason because they can't afford food. Real food. Now he's going to make them feel like shit even more by putting them on a program where they get canned meat, where they can't even eat real food. I don't know, folks. I just think America has totally went to crap. I really, honestly do. You know, Mr. Trump, if you ever listen to this video, I want you to eat the canned meat. I want you to drink the bagged milk. I want you to eat what you're trying to give these people to eat. I bet you won't. But you're trying to make these people feel even worse than what they already do? How low can a rich man get?
really, how low can a rich man get?